During June of 2004, the scientific establishment of parapsychology was contacted by Mr. Fadden, a welder from Bury, UK, who informed them that he and his family were having some sort of problem in his house. His family had moved into their three-bedroom house only eight months back, and since strange sounds could be heard during the night, objects would disappear and then later turn up in odd places. And his son Michael, aged 19, believed that he was having bedroom visitations. Researcher Steve Mira listened to his story and became intrigued. Mr. Fadden had been married for 28 years and had one son, Michael, who was a student and living at home with his parents. The family also had two pet dogs, Max and Ben, two brown Staffordshire Bull Terriers. Mr. Fadden was a well-built guy, around six and a half feet in height, and had been a steel welder for around 16 years. The family had lived in Middleton before moving to a larger house in Bury about eight months ago, and all seemed as normal until a couple of months after moving in. Mr. Fadden told Steve that he had experienced something that has troubled him ever since. My son Michael went out to walk the dogs around the nearby reservoir, and when he returned, I was shocked to see the state he was in. He was as white as a ghost, excuse the pun, and shaking all over. He looked terrible. I asked him what was the matter. He eventually told me that he was walking towards the estate and something caught his eye behind him. He quickly turned to see something very unusual. He could only describe it as a large moving black mass which was following him and then it lifted and traveled towards a neighbor's house, passing through several brick walls on its way. Mr. Forshaw, a neighbor, witnessed the same thing. It eventually reached the neighbor's house and disappeared through the wall. I couldn't believe it. My son is usually scared of nothing. I've never seen him like that before. I went outside for a look around and chatted with Mr. Forshaw about what he had seen. I couldn't see anything unusual. However, Mr. Forshaw did back up his son's story. A few days later, my son said he was going to his friends and that he would not be home until late. Anyway, we went to bed leaving the landing light on. We both fell asleep fairly quickly. Then suddenly we woke to the terrible sound of our son downstairs. It sounded like he was crying and fighting with someone. We rushed downstairs to the lounge where Michael sprawled out on the floor in tears. What the hell is going on, I said. We got Michael up, but he was struggling to catch his breath. As Jill, Mrs. Fadden, was making him a drink, Michael tried to explain to me what had happened. He'd come home around 1.15 and had made himself some cheese on toast. As he settled down to his snack, he had leaned forward to grab the TV remote when suddenly something seemed to grab him from behind. He felt as if something had literally jumped on his back. As he panicked and struggled to get this thing off him, he felt as if he'd had an electric shock. Michael ended up on the floor, kicking and shouting out, but the more he struggled, the more the electric shocks seemed to continue. Then, when I had shouted out Michael's name from the top of the stairs, whatever it was, let go of him. It took forever to calm Michael down, and we pretty much ended up staying up for the duration of the night. Michael was so upset, he said that he was going to move out and live with his friend. We didn't know what to do. On another occasion, my wife asked me to go to the fish and chip shop for tea, so I reached out to grab my van keys off the telephone table, and they were gone. We looked high and low, but we couldn't find them anywhere. I always put the keys on a small table beside the phone, but there were no sign of them. I ended up ringing into work that I'd lost the keys to the van. They were not pleased to say the least. The following morning, as I was putting my coat on, I decided to have one more check in my pockets. But no, nothing was in them. I heard my friend beep his horn outside once again, and as I made my way to the door, I had one last fleeting glance down at the telephone table. I couldn't believe it. There were the keys, just sat there exactly as I had left them the night before. We had all checked the table several times, and the keys were definitely not there. Amazed at the find, I just grabbed them and made my way out of the door. Mrs. Fadden had her own story to tell. I've had unusual things happen in the house when Alan's gone out to work. Sometimes the dogs appear to be looking at something that I can't see, and they often act a little strange upstairs. I've seen a dark shape moving around and heard footsteps twice coming from upstairs when I'm the only one, 
and I also felt a cold breeze in the lounge and on the staircase several times. But the most common thing is that items always seem to disappear and turn up in odd places. Sometimes I just put it down to me being tired. A few weeks ago, I'd come in from shopping and was unpacking the bags in the kitchen. I had purchased a bottle of aftershave for Michael's birthday, but as I unpacked, I quickly realized that it wasn't in any of the bags. I was sure I'd purchased it, so I hunted out the receipt, which was in one of the discarded bags on the floor. Just as I thought, there it was on the receipt along with toothpaste, soap, and other bathroom materials. I quickly checked again, I had everything but the aftershave. I assumed it must have somehow fallen out of my bag whilst on the bus, and thought nothing more of it. That is, until Michael's birthday. I had got up earlier that normal to make Michael a nice breakfast before he set off for college. Alan had already left for work a good hour before. Michael came down and was sat having breakfast whilst I filled the kitchen sink bowl with hot water. Then, all of a sudden, we heard an almighty crash. I remember seeing Michael jump in fear. He had not been the same since that terrible night he was attacked. Michael just stared at me and said, No way am I going up there. I knew I had to go at some stage, so I grabbed Alan's umbrella and headed up the stairs. I pushed open the bedroom door and looked in. Nothing seemed to be out of place, so I headed into the bathroom, and that's when I saw it. The missing bottle of aftershave I had purchased was in the bath. It had been unwrapped and the box was lying next to the bottle. I couldn't believe it. This thing was still around and now playing tricks. I quickly grabbed the bottle and put it back in its case and dropped it into my dressing gown pocket. When I got back downstairs, I told Michael that I had left my window open and that the morning breeze had blown the neck curtain and knocked a small vase off the window ledge. I didn't want Michael to know what had happened. He'd already been on the verge of moving out. After he left for college, I wrapped the aftershave up and gave it him when he got back. I told Alan when he got home, which seemed to unnerve him yet again. I've also seen that dark mass at least four times now. The last time I saw it was when I was coming in from the post office last Wednesday. As I came up the path, I saw something move in the lounge. I just froze, thinking we may have a burglar. Both Alan and Michael had both gone out early that morning and were not due back until tea time. As I stepped closer to the window, I saw a three to four foot tall dark mass slowly moving from beside the TV and out of the lounge door. No way was I going back into that house alone. I ended up at my mum's. When I got there, I just broke down. I didn't know what to do. My mum wouldn't even come back with me. I ended up waiting for Alan to finish work. I telephoned Alan and told him what had happened. He later picked me up from my mum's house. When we reached home, Alan went in first to check around. A minute or so later, he came to the front door and waved me in. Nothing was out of place, but we both remember an odd smell lingering around the staircase. It smelled like rotten fish. I ended up leaving two automatic air fresheners in the hallway. That night we were plagued by lights flickering. Alan had gone to the front door to look at the lights coming from our neighbor's house, but only hours seemed to flicker. By morning, the smell had gone and the lights were working as normal. Steve's first impressions was that both Mr. and Mrs. Fadden were telling him the truth. He could clearly hear that they were scarred. Several times during the interview, Mrs. Fadden became very upset, as if she was reliving her experiences. October the 8th, 2004. Steve visited the Fadden's house to conduct further interviews. Mr. and Mrs. Fadden had been keeping a record of events. It had only been a few weeks since they had talked with the family and was eager to find out if any other incidents had taken place. He pulled up outside their home and immediately realized that news of him attending had spread around the local neighborhood. Mr. Forshaw was out and standing by his gate. As Steve got out of the car, he called him over. Are you the ghost guy, he said. Steve amusingly replied and said yes. Well, I saw that thing as well. It was about the size of a child and it was following their young lad home. When I saw it, it shot off over there, pointing towards the house next door to the Fadden's. It went right through the wall and disappeared. Never seen anything like that in 63 years and never want to again. Steve was pleased that he had an independent witness to an event which would have been difficult to believe otherwise. 
He walked up the pathway to the Fadden's front door, where Michael was waiting for him. Come in, Mum and Dad are in the kitchen, he said. Steve sat around their small kitchen table, sipping hot coffee, as Mr and Mrs Fadden told him of what had been going on. Mrs Fadden was first to talk. Last Thursday was the worst. I'd come in from getting the washing off the line, and the telephone rang. It was my mum, just checking on how things had been. I was just telling her that it had not been too bad recently when I heard a growl coming from the lounge. I didn't think that much of it, just thought it was one of the dogs playing up. I walked into the lounge whilst on the phone with my mum, and when I got in, I realised that the dogs were out the back. None of the dogs were inside. I told my mum on the phone to hang on a second whilst I checked to see if the dogs were still out there, and as I turned to come out of the lounge, I heard a deep, loud growl come from behind me. Well, I just freaked. I dropped the phone, and the back plate where you put the batteries in flew off. I rushed into the kitchen and out of the back door. I stood there, not knowing what to do for a good few minutes. I first sent the dogs in, which didn't seem to bother them. I saw this as a good sign and followed. I managed to get the phone back together and working and then rang my mum back. I ended up locking up and going round to my mum's. That growl scared me to death. I think whatever it is, it's playing games with us. Steve asked the family if they had heard this growling noise before. Mr. Fadden shook his head as if to suggest no, but Michael said yes. I've heard it a few times at night, but thought at first it was the dogs, but I heard it when the dogs were out. Items were still being moved and later found in odd places. Several important letters had gone missing and when Michael's front door key and bus pass disappeared last Tuesday, Mr. Fadden became outraged and ended up telephoning a local church and talking with a vicar. He had explained what had been going on and wanted rid of this menace. Mrs. Fadden was surprised. She didn't know how much all of this was really affecting her husband. Normally, he's the quiet and sensible type that normally finds a rational explanation for things. In fact, Mrs. Fadden thought that her husband didn't believe in religion and all that. She was rather taken aback at his sudden approach. She went on to say he'd obviously had enough and was now taking it into his own hands to sort something out. Mr. Fadden's conversation lasted some time and ended up with an agreement that the vicar would call to see them the following week. Steve finished up his interviews and discussed the possibilities of an active investigation utilizing specialized equipment. The Faddens agreed and a second visit to their home was planned for the following month. A week passed and Steve received a call from Mrs Fadden. Clearly the vicar's attendance to their home had not been beneficial. It would seem that things had got suddenly worse. It took a while for Mrs Fadden to calm down. She explained that she and her son had seen a dark round mass in the kitchen. It was like a dark round ball darting about the ceiling. It was also seen in the lounge and the dogs were going mad. Michael managed to photograph it and we called the vicar back to show him the photo, but this time he didn't seem interested. After that, the family had stayed up the rest of the night discussing their options. By 7am, they had decided to leave the house and temporarily live at their caravan until they'd sold the house. Mr Fadden would be left to sort out all the belongings and putting their house up for sale. Also, their son Michael was to live at his friend's flat whilst attending college. It would seem that the investigation had suddenly and abruptly come to a close. Over the following week, Steve visited the vicar and discussed with him the Fadden's experiences and why they felt it best to leave their home. The vicar had very little to say. I visited the house and did a blessing, but I never felt anything whilst I was there. I asked the family to attend church so to build the strength between them and God, but heard that they were moving. The family home was eventually sold to a Mr and Mrs Horton in October of 2005 for a knockdown price of £83,500. The Faddens eventually purchased another house in Radcliffe, Manchester in the UK, where they now reside. Michael now has his own flat and is living with his girlfriend. Since the family fled their home, they've had no further experiences. In February of 2006, Steve visited the Hortons and explained to them that a few odd things were reported to have taken place at their home, but both Mr and Mrs Horton could not think of anything unusual that had taken place since they'd moved in. Only their pet poodle on occasion would sometimes bark, a 
left a seemingly empty corner of the room 